exotics. 123. It soon became evident that in order to attain the desired physical properties, similar to those of jet fuel, the fuels would have to be alkyl derivatives of the brands. In the end, three of these were developed and put into fairly large-scale production. Matheson's HEG-2 was propyl pentaverane. Calories HiCal-3 and Matheson's HEG-3 were mixtures of mono-D and triethyl decaborane, and HiCal-4 and HEG-4 were mixtures of mono-D tri and tetramethyl decaborane. Both minus three and minus four contained traces of unsubstituted decaborane. The missing numbers represented the fuels in an intermediate stage of synthesis. The chemistry of the borohydrides was investigated as it had never been investigated before. Process details were worked out on the pilot plant level, two full-sized production facilities, one calorie, one Matheson, were built and put on stream, Handling and safety manuals were written and published and the whole thing was done on a crash basis. Never had one poor element been given such concentrated attention by so many chemists and chemical engineers. And then the whole program was brought to a screeching halt. There were two reasons for this, one strategic, one technical. The first was the arrival of the ICBM on the scene and the declining role of the long-range bomber. The second lay in the fact that the combustion product of boron is boron trioxide, B. 2. O. 3. And that below about 1800 degrees this is either a solid or a glassy, very viscous liquid. And when you have a turbine spinning at some 4000 RPM, and the clearance between the blades is a few thousandths of an inch, and this sticky, viscous liquid deposits on the blades. The engine is likely to undergo what the British, with precision, call catastrophic self-disassembly. All sorts of efforts were made to reduce the viscosity of the oxide, but to no avail. The hex and the high cals just could not be used in a jet engine. The plants were put on standby, and eventually sold for junk. The zip program was dead, but the memory lingers. It was by no means a total fiasco. The small fraction of the total cost which went for research added more to the corpus of boron chemistry in 10 years than otherwise would have been learned in 50. Asterisk one of the most interesting discoveries was that of the carborons, by Murray Cohen, of Reaction Motors, in 1957. The parent. Asterisk Dick Holzman was at ARPA at the time, and it is due to him that all this chemistry is available, and not buried forever in the files of the contractors and the services. He had all the information collected, heckled Ronald Hughes, Yvonne Smith, and Ed Lawless of Midwest Research Institute into putting it together in one volume. And finally edited production of the Barans and Belated Research, which was published by Academic Press in 1967. 124. Ignition. Compound. Five. Zero. C. Two. H. Twelve. Has the structure of a closed, symmetrical, icosahedral cage, and it and its derivatives exhibit a surprisingly high stability against oxidation, hydrolysis, and thermal decomposition. Neff, of Hughes Tool took advantage of this stability when he attempted to make a monopropellant based on a carboron derivative. See the monopropellant chapter. Derivatives may also be useful in high energy solid propellants, and even, possibly, as high temperature resistant plastics. As far as rocket propulsion itself was concerned, the result of the ZIP program was that there were now large stocks of diborane, the starting point for the synthesis of all the borans and their derivatives. Pentaborane, decaborane, and the hex and hycals available, so that their usefulness as fuels could be investigated on something more than the frustrating 50-pound level. Aerojet, starting about 1959, worked with hex 3 and pentaborane, burning them with N. 2. O. 4 or hydrogen peroxide, and reaction motors had most of the bugs out of the pentaborane peroxide system by 1964. With
proper injector designed the systems could be made to work and to yield something close to their theoretical specific impulse. And the problem of the solid deposits in the nozzle wasn't too important when the motor was of a respectable size. It didn't arise at all, of course, when a fluorine oxidizer was used. Don Rogilio, at Edwards Air Force Base, in 1962-64 burned pentaborane with NF. 3. And with N. 2. F. 4. And got quite a good performance, although, as the combination is a fiendishly hot one, he had a lot of trouble with burned out injectors and nozzles. But once pentaborane was made to work, nobody could find any particular use for it. The performance was good, yes, but the density of pentaborane is low 0.618 which militate against its use in a tactical missile. Further, the oxygen type oxidizers with which it performed best, peroxide and N. 2. Oh. 4. Had unacceptable freezing points. And if you used nitric acid, you lost a good deal of its performance advantage. And, of course, with any of these oxidizers, the exhaust contained large quantities of solid B. 2. Oh. 3. And a conspicuous exhaust stream may be undesirable. And if you used a halogen oxidizer, such as CLF. 3. The performance wasn't enough better than that of a hydrazine to be worth the trouble. And finally, it was still expensive. The situation was otherwise with diborane. It couldn't be used in a missile, of course, its boiling point is 92. 5 degrees, but might well be used in certain deep space applications where it's low density, 0.433 at the boiling point, wouldn't matter. Its natural partner was of 2. Although ONF 3 would also be suitable, and from 1959 to the present that combination has been under investigation by several agencies, among exotics 125 them reaction motors and NASA Lewis the combination is a hot one and it isn't easy to design injectors and nozzles which will stand it but the difficulties are far from insurmountable and an operational system does not seem far away the combination by the way is an unusually hairy one to work with both propellants being remarkably poisonous but rocket men usually know how to stay alive and it hasn't killed anybody yet one thing that might have kept pentaborane in the picture was the advent of bn system early in 1958 calorie chemical was the originator of the idea but within a year every propulsion contractor in the country plus jpl nasa and eafb had got into the act this is the idea Boron nitride, BN, is a white, crystalline solid, with a hexagonal crystal structure like that of graphite. Asterisk it is a very stable molecule, with an exothermic heat of formation of some 60 kilocalories per mole. Now, imagine the reaction of a borane with hydrazine. B. 2. H. 6. Plus N. 2. H. 4. 2 BN plus 5 H. 2. Or. 2 B. 5. H. 9. Plus 5 N. 2. H. 4. 10 BN plus 19 H. 2. The heat of formation of the BN would be the energy source, and the hydrogen would comprise the working fluid dragging the solid BN along with it, of course. Performance calculations indicated that the pentaborane hydrazine combination should have the astounding performance of 326 seconds. And brought out the even more astounding fact that the chamber temperature should be only about 2000 K. 1500 K or so cooler than anything else with that sort of performance. 
the thought of a storable combination with a performance above 300 seconds, and with such a manageable chamber temperature sent every propulsion man in the country into orbit. Getting enough pentaverane to work with was no problem, of course, in 1958 to 59. The Air Force had tons and tons of the stuff, from their Matheson operation, and hadn't the foggiest idea of what to do with it. So it was practically free for the asking, and everybody leaped into the act, uttering glad cries. Calorie, NASA Lewis, Reaction Motors, and EAFB were some of the first to try the combination. Most of them, at first, at approximately the 100-pound thrust level. Asterisk carbon, of course, occurs both as graphite and diamond. And some recent work indicates that BN can be had, not only with the graphite structure, but with a diamond like Serutlur, and as hard, OV harder, than diamond ill self. 126. Ignition. Reaction motors experience is typical. Hydrazine pentaverane was hypergolic, although ignition was a bit hard. Combustion efficiency was ghastly, about 85 to 88 percent C asterisk efficiency. Asterisk and specific impulse efficiency was worse. The engineers considered themselves lucky when they got 75% of the 326 seconds the calculation said they should get. Obviously, the combustion efficiency was the first problem to be tackled, for unless that was brought up to a reasonable figure nothing could be done about the specific impulse or anything else. Part of the difficulty stemmed from the fact soon discovered that the reaction does not go neatly to BN and hydrogen, as the equations say it should. Instead, some of the boron is exhausted as elemental boron, and the leftover nitrogen combines with some of the hydrogen to form ammonia. This, naturally, does not help performance. Another problem lay in the difficulty of mixing the pentaverane and the hydrazine so that they could react. Hydrazine is a water-soluble substance, and pentaverane is oil-soluble, and the two were remarkably stubborn about getting together. This led to the BN monopropellant work, described in the monopropellant chapter. Additives to the propellants were no help and everything from hydrazine nitrate to UDMH was tried. To get good mixing you simply have to use a remarkably sophisticated injector. Love, Jackson, and Haverman learned this the hard way, at EAFB, during 1959-60-61. As their thrust level rose from 100 to 5,000 pounds, and they laboriously dragged their C asterisk efficiency from 76% up to 95%, they experimented with no less than 30 different injectors. Each one more sophisticated and complicated than the last. While this was going on, the problems involved in handling pentaverane were still around and hairy. It was remarkably poisonous, as I have mentioned and it is hypergolic with the atmosphere, and the fires are brutes to extinguish. If you spray a burning pool of the stuff with water, the fire goes out eventually if you're lucky. But then the remaining unburned pentaverane is covered with a layer of solid boron oxide or perhaps boric acid, which protects it from the air. And asterisk C asterisk, pronounced C star, is a measure of combustion efficiency. It is derived by multiplying the measured chamber pressure by the area of the throat of the nozzle, and dividing this by the mass flow of the propellants. It comes out in feet per second or meters per second, depending on the system you use. Its theoretical value can be calculated, just as theoretical specific impulse can, and the percentage of theoretical C asterisk that you measure experimentally is a good measure of the completeness of combustion and of the efficiency of the injector. Exotics. 127. If that crust is broken, which is certain to happen, the fire starts all over again. Even disposing of leftover pentaverane is a problem, but not one I'll go into here. Holzman's book tells all about it, if you're interested. Considering all this, 
I asked some of Rocketdyne's people. Rocketdyne was working closely with EAFB on their VN work how they managed to live with the stuff. Oh, it's no problem, they answered. You just follow the directions in our safety manual. I asked them to send me a copy of said manual, and in due time it arrived. It would be a misstatement to say that it was the size of the Manhattan phone book, but I've seen a great many municipalities with smaller ones. And even with the help of the manual, one of their rocket mechanics, a little later, managed to get himself hospitalized because of pentaverane. The final step in the BN work was to scale up to a larger motor, of some 30,000 pounds thrust, and this was done at Edwards during 1961-62-63. Incidentally, a lot of the work with hazardous propellants has been done at Edwards. It's located in the middle of the Mojave Desert, and you don't have to worry about the neighbors. Even if you spill a ton of liquid fluorine and that's been done there, just to see what would happen the only thing that's likely to be damaged is the peace of mind of a few jackrabbits and rattlesnakes. I saw movies of some of the test runs, and they were spectacular, with dense white clouds of solid BN rising two miles into the sky. The results with the big motor were poor at first about three quarters of the theoretical specific impulse but they improved with injector design, and before the end of 1963 the magic 300 seconds had been reached. The final injector comprised some 6,000 carefully drilled orifices. It was not cheap to manufacture, but the BN system had finally been made to work, and was a success. The only fly in the ointment was that the system was obsolete at birth. CIF 5 Arrived on the scene just as BN succeeded and the CIF 5 Hydrazine combination performs as well as the hydrazine pentaverane system, is much denser, and much easier to handle, works in a much simpler and cheaper motor, has an invisible exhaust stream, and is cheaper by at least an order of magnitude. Five years of work had been a frustrating exercise in expensive futility. Sometimes rocket men wonder why they ever got into the business. However, there does seem to be some hope for the BN system, in a rather specialized application. Aerojet, fairly recently, 1966-67, has been investigating the usability of the combination in a ram rocket, where the exhausted hydrogen, BN, elemental boron, and ammonia would be burned by the intake air. To give extra thrust, and has found. 128. Ignition. That it works very well indeed in such an arrangement. So perhaps the Edwards people didn't labor entirely in vain. The borohydrides were related fuels that never quite made it. Here a word of explanation seems to be in order. Borohydrides come in two, or perhaps three types. The first type comprises the alkali metal borohydrides, LeBH. 4. NABH. Four. and so on. These are straightforward ionic salts white crystalline solids, with no nonsense about them. They are reasonably stable NABH. 4. Is almost stable in water and can be handled easily. Lithium borohydride, as has been mentioned, was tried as a freezing point depressant for hydrazine by Don Armstrong at Aerojet as early as 1948. He found that the mixture was unstable, but nevertheless Stan Tannenbaum, at RMI, tried it again in 1958, with the same results. And then, back at Aerojet, Rosenberg lit on the same mixture in 1965. And he found that 3% of the borohydride decomposed in 200 days at 69 degrees. All of which gives one a feeling of this is where I came in. Sodium borohydride is much more stable than is the lithium salt, and its solution in liquid ammonia is quite stable, and Aerojet fired this, with oxygen, in 1949. But its performance was inferior to that of hydrazine and the work wasn't followed up. And Patrick McNamara, 
at AAFB, fired a hydrazine solution of the sodium salt with chlorine trifluoride in 1965, but got a performance inferior to that of pure hydrazine. The second type, the perhaps, includes ammonium and hydrazinium borohydride, which can be made in situ in liquid ammonia or hydrazine, but which would be unstable if isolated at room temperature. Aerojet burned a solution of hydrazinium borohydride in hydrazine, with oxygen, in 1949. I suspect that the mixture was unstable, for nothing more ever came of it. The third type includes the aluminum and beryllium borohydrides, A1, BH, 4, 3, and B, BH, 4, 2. These are covalent compounds, with unusual bonding, liquids at room temperature, and violently hypergolic with air. Nobody has ever had enough beryllium borohydride all together in one place and at one time for a motor firing, but Armstrong and Young at Aerojet fired aluminum borohydride with oxygen in 1950. And the next year Wilson, also at Aerojet, burned it with liquid fluorine. The results were not sufficiently encouraging to outweigh the difficulties involved in handling the fuel, and aluminum borohydride lay more or less dormant for some 10 years. Then, starting about 1960, Dr. H. W. Schultz and J. N. Hoxid, at Exotics 129 Union Carbide, started the development of the Hybelins, and Something rare in the propellant business they did it with company, not government, money. Aluminum borohydride forms a mole for mole addition compound in a duct with amines. And these adducts are not spontaneously INF flammable in the atmosphere, but with reasonable precautions, can be handled without any particular difficulty. Schultz and Hoxid experimented with dozens of different amines, but the fuel they settled on, as having the best combination of properties, was a mixture of the adducts of monomethylamine and of dimethylamine. They called it Hybeline A. 5. They also made some adducts of beryllium borohydride. These they called Hybeline B. They plugged the Hybelins for some four years, quoting calculated performance figures which were a wonder to behold. The only difficulty was that they assumed on the basis of certain very doubtful experimental figures a heat of formation for their mixture of adducts which was incompatible with that generally accepted for aluminum borohydride, and which generated a certain skepticism in their audiences. The question was finally settled when EAFB made a series of full-scale, 5,000-pound thrust, firings with Hybeline A. 5. And 2. 0. 4. And got a maximum of 281 seconds, much less than would have been delivered by, say, CLF. 5. And hydrazine. So, by 1964, the hyvalins were finished. The latest excursion into the realm of the exotic was made by F.C. Gunderloy, at Rocketdyne. He discovered that certain linear polymers of beryllium hydride and dimethyl beryllium, with the chains terminated with BH. 3. Groups, since the work is classified, I can't be more specific in describing them, were viscous liquids, and worked on them for four or five years. The chemistry involved is interesting for its own sake, but it doesn't appear likely to lead to a useful propellant. The liquids are extremely poisonous, and beryllium oxide, which would be one of the exhaust products if one of them were used as a fuel, is so toxic as to rule out any use in a tactical missile. And there are better fuels for space work. Setting to one side the problems of working with a high viscosity propellant, beryllium is a comparatively rare and quite expensive material, and there appear to be better uses for it. The development of these compounds would have been an admirable academic exercise well worth several PhDs in inorganic chemistry. As a propellant development program it can be classified only as an unfortunate waste of the taxpayer's money. So what's ahead for the exotics?
as I see it, just two things. 130 ignition. One divorane will probably be useful in deep space work. Two, the pentavorane hydrazine. BN system should be very good in ram rocket and similar systems. And the people who lost their shirts on boron stocks will have to discover a better way of getting rich from other people's work. For them, my heart does not bleed. 11. The hopeful monoprops. Monopropellants, unlike Gaul, are divided into two parts. Low energy monoprops are used for auxiliary power on a missile, sometimes for attitude control on a space vehicle, the Mercury capsules. And the X 15 airplane at high altitudes used hydrogen peroxide for attitude control, for tank pressurization, and the like. High energy monoprops, the Glamour Boys, are intended to compete with bipropellants for main propulsion. There haven't been too many of the first sort, and their development has been more or less straightforward. The first, of course, was hydrogen peroxide, used by von Braun to drive the turbines of the A4. He used a solution of calcium permanganate to catalyze its decomposition, but later workers at Buffalo Electrochemical Co. Beko found it more convenient to use a silver screen, coated with samarium oxide to do the job. I'm not sure whether samarium was chosen as a result of a systematic investigation of all of the rare earth metals, or because the investigator had some samarium nitrate in his stockroom. The leaders in this work were the people at RMI, who were investigating peroxide, at the same time, as the oxidizer for a super performance engine on a fighter plane. They had one interesting monopropellant application of age. 2. Oh. 2. Very much on their minds. This was the roar, or rocket on rotor concept, by which a very small perhaps 50 pounds thrust peroxide motor was mounted on the tip of each rotor blade of a helicopter. The propellant tank was to be in the hub of the rotor, and centrifugal force would take care of the feed pressure. The idea was to improve the performance of the 132 ignition chopper, particularly when it had to lift off in a hurry. That means when somebody is shooting at you. The work on this went on from 1952 to 1957 and was a spectacular success. I've seen an roar helicopter operating and when the pilot cut in his rockets the beast shot up into the air like a goosed archangel. The project was dropped, for some reason, which seems a shame. An roar chopper would have been awfully helpful in Vietnam, where somebody usually is shooting at you. At any rate, peroxide is still used as a low-energy monopropellant, and will probably continue to be used in applications where its high freezing point isn't a disadvantage. One such application is as a propellant for torpedoes. After all, the ocean is a pretty good thermostat. Here it is decomposed to oxygen and superheated steam, the hot gases spin the turbines which operate the propellers, and the torpedo is on its way. But here a little complication sets in. If you're firing at a surface ship, the oxygen in the turbine exhaust will bubble to the surface, leaving a nice visible wake, which not only gives the intended victim a chance to dodge, but also tells him where you are. Beko came up with an ingenious solution in 1954. They added enough tetrahydrofuran or diethylene glycol. Other fuels could have been used to the peroxide to use up the oxygen, letting the reaction go stoichiometrically to water and carbon dioxide. The water, steam, is naturally no problem, and co. 2. As anybody knows who's ever opened a can of beer, will dissolve in water with the help of a little pressure. That solved the wake problem, but made the stuff fearfully explosive, and brought the combustion temperature up to a level which would take out the turbine blades. So Beko added enough water to the mixture to bring the chamber temperature down to 180.0F, which the turbine blades could tolerate, and the water dilution reduced the explosion hazard to an acceptable level. Another low-energy monopropellant was propyl nitrate, 
first investigated around 1949 or 1950. It was plugged, enthusiastically, in England by Imperial Chemical Industries, who insisted that it was absolutely harmless and non-explosive. Ha! Huh? The RDE, W.A. The Mavi, investigated it and its homologues rather extensively, and in this country the Ethel Corporation and Wyandotte Chemical Co. did the same. The work in England was done on isopropyl nitrate, but in this country, due to a magnificently complicated patent situation, normal propyl nitrate was the isomer used. By 1956, not only Ethel and Wyandotte, but United Aircraft, JPL, Knott's, Aerojet, and the Naval Underwater Ordnance Station, the old torpedo station at Newport, the hopeful monoprops 133 were working with it either as an auxiliary power source or as a torpedo propellant and either straight or mixed with ethyl nitrate it was easy to start either a hot glow bar or a slug of oxygen and a spark plug were enough burned clean and smoothly and seemed to be the answer to a lot of problems and then it showed its teeth npn doesn't go off on the card gap tester you can throw it around, kick it, put bullets through it, and nothing happens. But if there is a tiny bubble of gas in it, and that bubble is compressed rapidly possibly by a water hammer effect when a valve is closed suddenly it will detonate violently. This is known as sensitivity to adiabatic compression, and in this respect it is at least as touchy as nitroglycerin. It was at Newport that it happened. Somebody closed a valve suddenly, the NPN let go, and the explosion not only did a lot of damage but convinced most rocket people that monopropellant was not for them. Another low-energy monopropellant that got quite a place starting about 1950 was ethylene oxide, C. 2. H. 4. Oh, it's commercially available, cheaply and in quantity, since it's an important chemical intermediate. It's easy to start a spark plug is enough to do it and decomposes in the reactor to, primarily, methane and carbon monoxide. It has a tendency, however, to deposit coke in the reactor, to an extent which depends upon the nature of the surface of the latter. This effect can be prevented by lining the chamber with silver the flame temperature is very low or by adding a sulfur containing compound to the propellant. It is also likely to polymerize in storage, forming gummy polyethylene ethers, which plug up everything. Sunstrand machine tool worked with it for several years, using it very successfully to drive a turbine. Experiment Incorporated, Walter Kitta, and Wyandotte Chemical also investigated it, and Forrestal Laboratory, at Princeton, tried it as the fuel of a ram rocket during 1954 and 1955. Some work was done on acetylenix, such as methyl acetylene and deisopropanyl acetylene, by experiment incorporated, by air reduction. And by Wyandotte between 1951 and 1955 but these were never successful as monopropellants too much coking, even if they didn't decide to detonate. A monopropellant with better staying power was hydrazine. Lewis Dunn, at JPL, investigated it in 1948 to 51 and it's still with us it can decompose either to hydrogen and nitrogen or to ammonia and nitrogen and the relative importance of the two reactions depends on any number of things the chamber pressure catalytic effects the stay time of the gases in the chamber and so on the reaction is best started by flowing the hydrazine through a catalyst bed into the comp 134. Ignition. Bustion chamber. Grant, at JPL, in 1953, came up with the first reasonably satisfactory catalyst, iron, cobalt, and nickel oxides deposited on a refractory substrate. The decomposing hydrazine, of course, reduces the oxides to the finely divided metals, which take over the catalytic role after startup but restarts, if the catalyst bed has cooled, are just about impossible. The Shell Development Company, in recent years, 1962 to 1964, 
has brought out a catalyst which allows restarts. Iridium metal deposited on the substrate. But nobody is really happy with it. It's easy to drown the catalyst bed by trying to run too much propellant through it, so that you get incomplete decomposition or none at all, and it works very poorly with the substituted hydrazines, which you have to use for low temperature applications. On top of that, Iridium is the rarest of the platinum metals and the catalyst is horribly expensive. And just to make it interesting, the major supplier of Iridium is the Soviet Union. Another way to get restarts is to use a thermal instead of a catalytic bed. This has a high heat capacity and is insulated against heat loss, so that it will stay hot for some time after shutdown, and will reignite the propellant on restart simply by heating it. For the original start, the bed is impregnated with iodine pentoxide, I, 2, O, 5, or with iodic acid, I, O, 3, either of which are hypergolic with hydrazine. But if the period between shutdown and restart is too long, all that we can say now is that a satisfactory technique for starting hydrazine decomposition is yet to be developed. It's still unfinished business. During the 10 years after World War II, a respectable amount of monopropellant work was going on in England. Not only were the British very much interested in peroxide, both as an oxidizer and as a monopropellant, and in propyl nitrate and its relatives. They were also intrigued with the idea of a monopropellant which could compete with bipropellants for main propulsion. As early as 1945 they fired the German 80 20th mixture of methyl nitrate and methanol, and came I.O. the regretful conclusion that it was something that just couldn't be lived with, in spite of its respectable performance. Then the Waltham Abbey people came up with another idea. The Dithokites had been developed during the war as liquid explosives, and ERDE thought that they might possibly be good monopropellants. The dithokites are mixtures comprising one mole of nitrobenzene and five of nitric acid, which makes the mixture stoichiometric to water and co. 2. And a varying percentage of water. D20 contains 20% water. Even with the added water, the mixtures weren't too stable, and the nitrobenzene had a tendency to get nitrate further. But the British tend to be more casual, or braver. The hopeful mono props. 135. About such things than we are in this country, and that didn't deter them appreciably. Nor did another hazard, peculiar to the dithokites. They are, of course corrosive, and very rough on the human skin, and to make it worse, the highly poisonous nitrobenzene was absorbed rapidly through the damaged tissue into the anatomy of the victim, subjecting him, as it were, to a one-two punch. However, they persevered and fired the things more or less successfully in 1949-50. Only to discover that if you put enough water into them to keep them from blowing your head off the performance you got wasn't worth the trouble. End of Dithokites.